Okay, um, w welcome back everybody. Maybe some of you have been out in the fresh air. We opened the door here as well to let a bit of fresh air in so you can all enjoy the concluding event of, of this uh, uh, conference and I'm delighted uh, to see so, so many people here for our keynote address. Um, just briefly, um, some of you may have had an older uh, version of our conference program which advertised um, Professor Jertz Bergaren from Wageningen as the keynote uh, speaker and Jert had to contact us two weeks ago to send his apologies uh, for family reasons and um, so we were uh, basically we were looking for a keynote speaker for, for our conference and we approached Martina Schaefer uh, two weeks ago approximately and uh, she kindly agreed um, to actually help us out and to step in and we're absolutely delighted uh, to have Martina Schaefer here um, tonight for this concluding event. Just maybe to say a little bit about uh, Martina, she's one of the directors of the Centre for Technology and Society and CTS at the Technische Universität Berlin, the Technical University in Berlin. And this is a center uh, which promotes inter and transdisciplinary research um, in the fields of energy and climate, uh, mobility, as well as land use and consumption patterns. Uh, and Martina has an interdisciplinary background uh, with PhDs in environmental engineering and sociology. And uh, her focus um, has been on sustainability research, in particular in the fields of uh, sustainable consumption, um, sustainability innovations, um, as well as sustainable regional development. So this is uh, just a bit of background about uh, Professor Martina Schaefer, and just to maybe say a little bit about um, the talk that we're about to hear, which is entitled Take Home Messages for Sustainable Consumption. And this is uh, really one of the outputs, the many, many outputs uh, of, a, of a research um, program uh, which ran from 2008 to 2011 and which was funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And it was entitled From Knowledge to Action, New Paths Towards Sustainable Consumption. This is one of uh, uh, the key outputs, really a kind of synthesis effort between all the different work packages within that program and uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that synthesis effort and uh, so without much further ado I'd like to hand over uh, to Professor Schaefer. Yeah thanks a lot Henrique. Uh, um, you are really a very courageous audience that you're sticking here <laughs> uh, still so I can feel kind of sorry since the sun came out and uh, I'm sure many of you would like to you know uh, Take a walk, but we'll soon do that. And um, well, I heard some expectations that you know I might wrap up all the content we heard during those last two days. I have to disappoint you a little since that was not my task. Uh, I leave that completely to the consensus team. <laughs> uh, but maybe I mean I think there is kind of a um, synergy. Uh, there, because many times today I thought, oh, those messages we were putting together in that program really reflect, of course, a lot of those contents we have been discussing during those last two days. And um, so I think uh, maybe partly it, 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 it will fit very well. And um, so I want to thank you also to, for inviting me. I mean, I was uh, planning to come anyways, uh, since I'm accompanying the consensus team already uh, for some while. And it was very nice now to see the results coming in. And I think, yeah, we had really some very nice discussions uh, during those last two days. So um, as Henrique said, I want to introduce uh, that program to you. Um, and I want to give you some insight in that iterative process of developing mes messages, um, take-home messages. I want to introduce them to you briefly uh, and uh, draw some conclusions. And um, as Henrike said, it, that was a program running from 2008 to 2011 or 12 in Germany and um, they were uh, 10 inter and transdisciplinary projects in the field of sustainable consumption with some focus on uh, use of energy. Um, and all in all, uh, around 40 universities and research institutions were participating in that program and around 80 practitioners were also uh, being active partners in that program and beyond, of course, uh, one was taking in much more practitioners on the way. So you see all the logos of the projects uh, down there. 
which were dealing uh, with very different uh, questions. And uh, just to give you some impressions, I mean, um, some of them were dealing with those more uh, very conscious decisions like uh, retrofitting uh, the, the own home, uh, others more with uh, daily routines, and um, there was a certain focus on energy use, but also nutrition and mobility were uh, topics that were de dealt with. And to give you some impression, uh, for example, the project in Telecon was dealing with the question, how can smart metering technology be designed according to users' needs? We were talking about that today also. And they uh, cooperated with uh, energy supplies of 10 German cities. Uh, the project change was addressing university staff and um, designing a campaign to address them uh, for energy saving. And they were cooperating with eight German universities. Um, then the project NF House was addressing private households and uh, dealing with the question how barriers to energy retrofitting can be overcome. And they, for example, were cooperating with the German Energy Agency and an association of consultants on energy and buildings. And uh, finally, just to give you an impression, the project I was coordinating, the project Live Events, it was mentioned several times today, uh, where we took up uh, in 2011 already the question how life events, uh, whether they uh, present an opportunity for change uh, in consumption habits and what type of campaign could link uh, to those life events. And we were ca designing, carrying out and evaluating a campaign in Berlin. So we were uh, cooperating with the Berlin City Council and also a campaign agency. So you see, it's a very broad range of issues and um, therefore also um, very different measures of interventions were either analyzed or developed, um, like um, um, internet tools, manuals, policy papers, workshops with practitioners. So all those projects really tried to come up with uh, results of practical relevance and, and uh, did their effort in transferring those results to uh, the related practitioners, um, as all of us do <laughs> every day. Uh, but still, the, however, the ministry also had the aspiration uh, that the main theoretical, but also uh, results of practical relevance should be synthesized for the whole program. And um, I always remember that we had some official of the ministry who was responsible for us, and he was always telling us, you know, once in a while I have the chance to be in the elevator together with the director of my department, and then I have three minutes time to tell him, you know, what we are doing on great things in that program, and what are the results, and I need, you know, those three minutes uh, slogans to give it to him. So, okay, I don't think we succeeded really to put it to three minutes, but, um, I think uh, many times, I mean, we have this kind of programs many times where we have 10 projects, 12 projects, dealing with one overarching uh, topic, like in that uh, uh, opportunity was uh, bridging the knowledge action gap. And uh, after the projects have been carried out, still it's kind of difficult to say, okay, what's, what are the main findings of the whole program? Can we say something? And um, this cannot be done, you know, accidentally on the way. It, it, you know, the single projects are so involved in uh, their own work and in trying to find solutions and transfer them to practitioners that this is an extra work which has to be done. And so um, we found it was quite progressive of the ministry to also fund a so-called accompanying research team, which is uh, quite usual now in Germany, I don't know, uh, if you have it here too, um, uh, which really accompanied the whole process um, and um, helped us in uh, really motivating us to, to work on those um, integrated results for the whole program. And as you can imagine, this is not an easy task since we all were primarily occupied with our projects and 
um, you know, getting uh, the design done and the empirical work and so on. Uh, but they, um, you know, once in a while we had meetings, we had workshops, and uh, they motivated us to reflect on the work we were doing in those projects and to come to joint conclusions um, um, in the scientific uh, field, but also regarding uh, the results of practical relevance. So they were organizing a scientific conference. We contributed to a volume with uh, the main findings, uh, also with um, four or five articles, where always five or six persons of different projects were contributing to, um, and especially Xiu and Gaia. So that was more the scientific part. But then also this work on the uh, consumption messages with this, uh, that book on the right side, unfortunately only in German till now. I have to admit, uh, we've got it on the list to at least, you know, write an article about that. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. So um, we were um, 13 people, 13 researchers participating in that progress, some of the project leaders, but also some other researchers and the accompanying research team. And all in all, it was a three year process really to identify those messages, to uh, formulate them, um, to write first drafts, and then um, those drafts, which mostly were written by two or three persons, um, each message, then uh, underwent a very intensive internal review process. So we were really you know, struggling to find those um, central messages. And then we said, OK, um, we need the feedback of practitioners also uh, at that point. So we organized, or the accompanying research team organized a conference, Consumption and Sustainable Development, Messages to, for Politics and Practice in 2011 in Berlin. And we invited um, practitioners of yeah, strategic value um, based on a policy wheel. So we visualized you know, which practitioners um, are very influential on uh, consumption policies. And um, we were very pleased that 70 um, people came from a broad range uh, of fields from politics, administration, business, civil society, organizations, etc. And that conference was kind of unusual also because there was no input. Um, we sent uh, the messages or the draft of the messages out one week before the event. And then at the event, we only, only uh, discussed or really worked in um, smaller groups and everybody had the chance to, to discuss four of the messages. So it was very intense, lively discussions. And after that, of course, we had the challenging task of, you know, uh, going through those long protocols, uh, minutes, and, and uh, take out the content and uh, reviewed, uh, revised the messages. So quite an intensive uh, process, and what were our aspirations? Um, we wanted to formulate messages which are easy to understand, uh, but we didn't want to formulate simple messages um, because we think one of the reasons that we are not really advancing and we have been talking about that during those last two days uh, is that there are too many simple messages around in this field. Um, so we really had the aspiration to succeed in covering the complexity of the whole consumption system um, of consumption being embedded in societal context structures, etc. And also we wanted to cover the whole range of consumption acts and the whole process of choosing, acquiring, using, and disposing consumption goods. And um, so we are not addressing the, the consumer, the end consumer, but we are addressing um, people who are influencing the discourse about sustainable consumption and are taking uh, decisions uh, on a daily basis. So people in politics, administration, but also business, of course, and um, civil society organizations. So how are, th how are those messages um, structured? Um, we, 
every message has a name, which already gives us some hint what uh, they are dealing with. Then a one phrase statement, which captures the core. Um, and then uh, we always formulated a societal myth. Um, and I think we've been talking about those myths uh, which are around. Um, and we wanted to take those up, yeah, those simple messages. <laughs> and um, so one of the very persistent ones, I mean, not in that audience, but I, I always am confronted with that myth wherever I go. Uh, the one, um, you know, just give the consumer more information and then he will act, take it up and act um, sustainably. This myth is, you know, very, very strong still. And if you look at the majority of interventions, it's uh, on that communication base. And, you know, we, we try to take up um, myths um, which are around um, regarding sustainable consumption and try to respond to them with a alternative draft. Um, and then, of course, we explained the message uh, a little more detailed and added some illustrative examples, which mostly were referring to the projects, the research projects we had been doing during the last um, three years. And we finalized the texts about the messages always with some recommendations for political and civil society actors how to follow up um, with that message. So I want to introduce um, the eight messages to you very shortly, and then I uh, want to go into some detail with some of them. I think you don't want to listen to me till midnight, so we'll keep it short <laughs> today, um, but just to give you an impression. Um, so I think some of them link very nicely to the, what we have been discussing today. The first one being that um, sustainable consumption is nothing you can really determine objectively. Um, but it, it's uh, a so societal nego negotiation pro process is really needed to determine what sustainable consumption is. Then what we have been take, talking about also today, setting standards. Um, and it has been said today that climate change cannot be felt and whatever, but I think there are many things that are out there that can be seen and related to. And um, so if we uh, still say that sustainable development has the goal to assure a good life for everybody, for every human being today and in the future, then um, uh, it's necessary to set minimum and maximum consumption standards. The courage message, we've been also talking about that today. Um, so if we really say uh, fundamental changes are necessary, then we are convinced that um, to put sustainable consumption into practice needs uh, courage to make unpopular political decisions and to stick to them, which sometimes is <laughs> the more, more challenging task even. Uh, the empowering message which refers to education, that education needs to provide people with the necessary skills to participate in shaping sustainable consumption. Um, the governance message taking up that um, to steer towards sustainable consumption has to be done in an intelligent way with a mix of different instruments and you know, not only um, incentives, financial incentives on the one side, or not only communication measures on the other side, but a very uh, well-balanced mix of those different approaches. The adoption message taking up all those difficulties in integrating sustainable consumption in daily life. Um, I think you are the experts on that here. Um, the structure message um, saying that structures are created by very many different actors, um, so not only politicians, but also city planners and um, uh, businesses offering certain goods, um, who are thus uh, responsible for fostering sustainable consumption. And finally, the exploration message, uh, which takes up that um, that path to towards sustainable uh, consumption is not clear yet. We are, you know, we're always we're still on a searching 
exploration process and we have to look where it takes us to. So we really need those experiments we were talking about today and um, to acknowledge them as being valuable and take up those experiences as enriching impulses for sustainable consumption strategies. So those are the eight messages, of course, very shortly. And I think on the one side you could say, okay, it's nothing new, you know, but you know, you are the experts already. Uh, and we think that in a whole, um, they quite, they give quite a good picture of the complexity we are dealing with. And uh, I think many of the people we address with those messages, they have a, only part of the picture. And so it can be rather helpful to get the whole picture. So I want to show only one example in a little more detail and then three other ones um, a little shorter. So the setting standards message, which maybe is also one of the more, more contradictional one or one which uh, people uh, would react to um, with you know, criticism or questions. Um, so the myth we are reacting to, and we have been talking about that today, is that sovereignty of consumers has to be defended. Consumers have to be free in their decisions, what to consume. You know, politics cannot interfere in that freedom. And, um, and also that it's not necessary since we can accomplish sustainable consumption by product standards, technical progress, and a more efficient use of resources. Um, and coming with that argumentation, I think we all have heard that, that the high risk, um, if we limit consumer serenity, that this could undermine quality of life as a whole and be a big risk to the economic system, which depends on a high turnover of consumption goods. And um, so we were trying to uh, write a, an alternative draft to that myth um, and you know, relating to the basis that sustainable development aims at enabling a good life for all human livings, for all humans living today and in the future. And this requires, on the one side, minimum standards, which define which natural and societal resources have to be available for all human beings to be able to lead a good life. And I think there are attempts in that direction. I mean, Nations like Germany, Great Britain, etc., are doing that in some form with the social aid um, um, discussion and so on. Um, also, this is not referring to uh, natural resources, but you know, the idea of minimum standards at least is already in the world. But more controversial, of course, is the idea of maximum standards, at least here in the industrialized countries. Um, uh, which assure that the consumption level of one part of the population does not endanger the minimum requirements for others. And I think the nearest we got till today um, in, in, in that field is the two degree goal we have on an international level, uh, which you know would have to be broken down uh, to national level and um, maybe also an individual level. Um, and so if we really succeed in, in formulating those, we uh, result in a corridor of resource supply for every human being. And within that corridor, I think we don't, you know, there's no question that people are free to decide how to consume, but um, it's the corridor we, we need. And um, also uh, regarding the risks for economy, I think there's a good argument that uh, consumption which contributes to a good life for everybody offers a chance to design societal and economic activities in a future-oriented way. So the ones who go ahead uh, in that sense will hopefully be the ones who um, you know, are uh, winning in the future. So it was said that climate change cannot be felt and you know we, we cannot see it, but I think we surely can see that some of the things um, our present standard of living is causing in other parts of the world um, does not allow other people to lead a good life, be it the exploitation of oil, of 
rare metals of the rainforest, um, overfishing, etc. Um, so I think there are very concrete things we could point out, uh, which make uh, those maximum standards necessary. And of course, that's not an easy thing to deal with. And um, so what we are recommending is, um, or what is implied with that suggestion is that um, sufficiency uh, strategies um, have to be discussed as intensely as uh, effic efficiency uh, strategies. And um, yeah, uh, government, which has the courage to, to start an offensive dialogue about the necessity of minimum and maximum standards would be a very progressive uh, government. And um, of course, this process should be supported by civil society, by the media. Maybe the churches could be you know, an actor which could be active uh, in that sense. And um, in that group, we have been trying to follow up on some of those things. And um, the accompanying research team, they come from Switzerland. And it seems that there already there's a foundation which is interested in starting off such a discussion uh, process. So that, that would be very interesting to, to observe what's coming out of a discourse on these issues. And the second thing which we have been discussing also today would be uh, the reduction or ban of advertisements which puts the acquisition of more goods on the same level with quality of life. And you know, it was said also in the audience um, that we have still so many um, messages around which are always encouraging us to you know, consume that cheap meat and buy that fast car and take that cheap fare to go shopping for the weekend to Paris or whatever, or to a nice conference. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's uh, this kind, of course, of um, communication which makes things very difficult. The second example, the courage message, um, is about yeah, courage in the, on the political floor and um, to um, make unpopular political decisions once in a while. Um, so um, um, I think um, we all in Europe and maybe all over the world, we feel this uh, discontent partly with politics because I think many people feel that what politics is doing is not adequate um, looking at the big problems we are facing. So I think, um, you know, one shouldn't underestimate this intelligence of um, the masses <laughs> for some, uh, in some uh, sense. So, I mean, we in Germany, we are facing it right now very clearly. We have been taking a far-reaching decision with the um, uh, stop of nuclear energy with the Energiewende, and now, of course, we have, have been facing a lot of resistance from powerful actors, and the difficulty really is to stick to those decisions. And, but that also needs, of course, societal support. I mean, you need those actors who stand up and say, yeah, stick to it, you know. And um, yeah, we hope that, at least in Germany, we'll, we'll stick to our decisions, but we can always see that this is a difficult um, thing and that we should also support our politicians in, in you know, taking those decisions and uh, strengthening them. And, but those, this discontent with that politics many times is not able to act. Um, I think it's, it's widespread, widely spread, and we have it very clearly also with the climate change uh, conferences. Um, you know, uh, we are observing them and we think, okay, another conference which didn't lead to anything. And, so I think this is in the air, and politicians maybe have more um, leeway there than they think themselves. The third um, example, the structure message, um, points out that structures, contexts are um, um, created by very many different actors. I mean, that's nothing new to you. Um, but. Um, it's really um, addressing that consumers cannot act completely free 
but they are you know, always confronted with conditions that have impacts on their actions. And you know, all the examples were around here, if you're living in rural areas or don't have public transport, what are you supposed to do? But also the question of societal norms, values, and economic structures like the supply with certain good, the accessibility, you know, to be able to eat organic in the new canteen, and so on. Um, and yeah, it stresses the responsibility of all those actors. Um, and I think that many times is, many actors are not aware, really, that they are creating very massive uh, structures and they think the responsibility is with politics, but they are not the only ones who are um, creating those structures. Um, and we all know how uh, some structures can be either be favorable to adopt sustainable um, consumption habits, and I don't even want to start talking about the strike we have been <laughs> confronted with during the last weeks in Germany, the railway strike, but the normal, you know, uh, I, I like that 1,387 <laughs> minutes uh, of delay. Well, uh, but also, you know, yeah, to, to do that every day, it's kind of, you know, putting yourself in under stress and trying to get with, go with a bike um, for children, for example. Um, but they are also favorable uh, structures you can create. This is famous Copenhagen, uh, but also, you know, car share uh, spaces, um, rent bike schemes, um, waste, um, things, etc. So there are many ways of really um, creating favorable conditions and I think we all know um, when it's uh, being made easy and when not. And the final one I want to show to you today and it's one of my favorites since I've also formulated it <laughs> uh, is the explor exploration message and um, the significance of experiences which are one in those social initiatives uh, that experiment with new lifestyles, with new consumption habits. And I mean, we all love those uh, initiatives and we love to analyze them and to look at them. <laughs> um, but in reality, I mean, many times they face a lot of resistance uh, of the local government, of the administration, and, um, you know, uh, you all know the times when eco-villages were popping up first. They were like the freaks doing some strange things, you know. And so there was nothing about um, uh, encouraging them and acknowledging, oh, you, 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 you're courageous, you know, you, you're doing um, um, good things, you're experimenting. And I think some, it's changing somehow, at least in Germany, we see that there's a movement in the environmental policy field um, um, that they are acknowledging oh, with all those leaflets and posters and campaigns, we didn't really get somewhere. So maybe we should look at those people who voluntarily um, take up um, those ideas and voluntarily are experimenting with new ways of living together and working and consuming. Um, so recently there has been a project um, about eco-villages as being models for uh, <laughs> sustainable consumption. It was quite funny because uh, suddenly you had people in one room discussing which normally wouldn't have met, you know, 10 years ago very different milieus, very different um, ways of living. And that's, that's, you know, their learning is happening uh, if those worlds come together. And um, so we think that here um, there's really a lot of knowledge and willingness to participate in sustainability transformations. We can see it in many different areas. And politics and administration should really acknowledge that and support those initiatives. And that doesn't always mean financially. It really means you know, taking away those barriers uh, they often are confronted with. Um, or you know, open gardening, many times they are on uh, areas 
temporarily only, which are taken away when the next investor is coming, and so on. So uh, I think a lot can be done there. And um, then also uh, take those experiences for a learning process, uh, a societal learning process. So we all know those um, big variety of initiatives that are around. And there's a lot, I think, to, to learn. Why are people doing that? What are the motivations? You know, many times uh, there are other mo motivations than the purely, you know, we want, want to live sustainably. It's um, the self-reliance, um, getting more independent and whatever. Um, very different motives also to start one or the other thing, um, um, which we could, you know, uh, take more advantage of. So to wrap up, um, I just want to show you some reactions we had on those um, messages. Um, that was feedback uh, after the conference we, we did with practitioners. And yeah, there were a lot of people uh, who liked these discussions and said, yeah, that was very valuable to, to have the synthesis and to be able to talk with scientists directly about the main results of such a program and to have it, you know, um, prepared so we could can really consume it as practitioners. So my conclusions, um, it's possible to bring together different perspectives and positions. Um, as I said, that was not an easy process and we were, we were coming from economy, from psychology, from sociology, from political science, and sometimes, you know, they were very intense discussions what, with, with what messages can we go out and can we really agree on. And, um, but it needs a facilitation of those processes. These processes don't run on their own. And so we were very lucky to have that team motivating us and pushing us also. Um, because, yeah, first uh, side, this is extra work which has to be done. Uh, but on the second side, of course, we also realized that it was valu very valuable to reflect the work we have been doing in those projects and, you know, to go on another level, on a meta level, okay, what can we say now in the end of that program? And I think this is valid uh, for a dialogue between different scientists as well as between science and practitioners. Um, personal meetings still are very important and form the basis for this type of cooperation, we think. Um, in between, you can have, you know, Skype talks and you can have exchange of documents and so on, but to really work together, you should be face to face uh, once in a while, and that's the nice point of being here also. <laughs> and of course, that costs, there are some costs, but uh, in the end, I think um, you get more out of those programs and so um, it's our recommendation to really install those kind of accompanying research teams um, with these kind of programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina, um, for a very interesting and stimulating talk. And I hope you have some questions from the floor so we can actually have a bit of a dialogue here. We have about 15, 20 minutes. So Anyone would like to start, perhaps, with some questions? Uh, maybe Ben first, and then Francis. Okay. I, I, I loved your your one, number four. Mm -hmm. What was the myth that it was cancer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that consumers are passive, and you have to give them um, rules how to act and information, and you know this passive consumer. It's definitely not palatable in, in many, many corners. But uh, the whole idea of the qu you know, quality of life, the good life more generally, and then material consumption is something that in has interested uh, Mary Jo and I since the very start of the Consensus Project. So we were very fortunate we added on some very useful questions onto that huge survey that we did. But we've tentatively been working on a, on a, pr a paper which we've, we've 
called setting the cake line exactly in the, the kind of respect you know we do talk quite rightly about the bread line but you know that discussion has not been had and what I thought was really interesting about one of the outputs from your project was that paper by Zantonetta and Doris Fuchs the corridors of consumption yeah. because that at least in a way it's it's, mm -hmm. a, it's what's more palatable in, in many respects but at the end of that paper they call for you know this is a good concept, but how are we empirically going to try and set, you know, and obviously it needs to be locally sensitive, culturally, it's, it's going to be different. But uh, we thought in the Irish context, a couple of really useful questions from the survey were, not only did we go through all household items and, what, and um, how many people had whatever items, and I know Ben has had that on his uh, New Zealand survey as well, but we asked people uh, whether they considered them luxuries or necessities. And that the data that's coming out of that is, is really fantastic because it comes back to Neil's point about, you know, again, going back to Max Neeps and, and needs. But, yeah. um, mm -hmm. So we have tangible empirical data there for one household, mm -hmm. 500 households. But it was just when I saw the publication that was in Gaia, mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah. consumption, uh, you know, that, that call, that, that could be a good response to that. So yeah. yeah. No, it's um, delighted to you. Yeah, that. I think that's a good point. The community should take that forward. Yeah. Maybe to just briefly add to this as well, there was a really interesting discussion during the height of the recession around the upper limits in terms of salaries for CEOs mm -hmm. and bankers. And I just thought it was a really interesting sort of space opening around yeah. discussing perhaps an upper limit. Um, so just as a comment. Sorry, there were a few arms going up. Could you please? Okay, me please. Thank you very much. That was an excellent sum up. And I think it helped to bring closure to the previous panel discussion as well, where you know, we were struggling with this thing on the individual versus the structure. And, uh, you know, the lady from London who came in by Skype was saying, after all the great work she's doing, Jim Adams, you know, she's frustrated. And to some extent, her frustration was with the structure level. So I think it would be great to get it translated into English. Mm. I know you have to talk here translated into Martin. It would be worth doing. But I have a question for you. Uh, this was funded by a ministry, and the messages you know, they're very kind of broad, but um, they're directed towards policymakers. What has been the follow-up by way of discussions at the ministry level or at the parliament in Germany of what's happening with these things? Yeah, not so much yet, uh, I have to admit. I mean, there are, we have addressed many practitioners, different practitioners, and um, but I cannot say really that a lot was taken up. I think there are initiatives of some of us trying to push one or the other. So I know about the Swiss team, they are really trying to push that um, idea about defining corridors and you know talking in their context with the Swiss actors. So there's still some, some work to do so they don't take it up so the on their own. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of. Maybe first Neil, then Sophie, and then Philip, and do some other. Okay, start with me. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I think it's really nice to see this kind of structured process to try and distill mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. down to, to that message. It made me think a little bit further. I think we were talking about the iterative kind of process, and we talk about practitioners sometimes in the group. But we're also thinking, how can we, we you know, what kind of group can we find to translate this? Mm. You know, so, so that we get these, these kind of messages then, but is that something you're already considering? Yeah, I mean, um, we had several reactions in that kind, and I think with, with publishing messages like that, also you give strength to some people who are pu pushing some items. So I don't think it's a process from, you know, yesterday to tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but uh, like those actors, I'm telling you, in the Agency for Environment, um, in Germany, who are um, m looking uh, into social innovation and eco villages and so on, they are also marginalized in their institution. So, with science saying, you know, this is important what you're doing, that you're acknowledging those actors, they feel strengthened and they have they get a better position in their institution. So, I think this is the kind of processes which are going on, which of course sometimes are not easy to follow, you know, where are they running, but uh, I think that's the idea of, of strengthening those people who are on that way already, but sometimes are also acting in a niche and um, having difficulties with their agenda. And, you know, they can, so you get a coalition of the willing. Yeah. <laughs>
ways. So uh, in a way my question would be a little bit provocative. It's about your uh, courage message. Uh, we know that a lot of the messages that are used are speaking about big change, about taking a totally different direction. And I was wondering if that could be, it could be another way which could uh, more draw on existing uh, uh, routines and, and, and practices that could be uh, eco-friendly by accident, as some of you already said, or which could be eco-friendly compatible, and we could imagine some messages that we more use some continuities. Like we, we studied food waste, and we noticed that a lot of people had some really good practices regarding food waste, and only for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of. Uh, uh, already uh, 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 set practices and we could draw maybe more on continuities that mm -hmm. could be less violent for a lot of people and encourage them uh, more. So it's yeah. Yeah, that's a point which was also raised sometimes that we should stabilize sustainable consumption patterns where they are because they sometimes are endangered, uh, like also cooking with regional food or knowing the recipes of some, you know. Uh, so there's knowledge there sometimes which is endangered and we should look at that also. What do we have to keep and how do we, you know, tell those people, oh, that's great what you're doing, you know. I think we said it today. So surely that can be one strategy also. Maybe just to briefly add to this to perhaps be also kind of aware of the fact that there might be different people engaging in the same practice for very different reasons. And the, 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 the big sort of socioeconomic question that hangs over that for me was always very important and that perhaps requires mm -hmm. different measures to protect their, um, their, their practices and, and different steps. So again, it's about sort of <coughs> targeting um, interventions perhaps as different groups, different socioeconomic groups as well. I'm just thinking about, you know, why do people save food and then, you know, avoid waste, there's different reasons for that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Philip first. Sorry. So apologies then, Graham. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, <coughs> I think um, what you really did is defining sustainable consumption in a very different way than it has been defined before, mm. uh, in, in a way that practitioners can understand. I think that's really, really powerful, and I really do encourage you to translate it. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing is that too bad the minister isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, uh, the other thing is that it's, it also puts it on the political agenda in a way that politicians mm. can understand. So even mm. if there's not a lot of follow-up, uh, it, it's still it's still powerful enough, mm. I think, for that. Um, of course, it also uh, does not uh, address everything, right? So cultural change. And for instance, criticizing the economic growth paradigm, right? Things like that. Of course, I can understand that in the process like that, it, it cannot be there. But uh, yeah, and finally, I would say that I talked earlier about uh, the 10 year framework of programs. I think that it would be really powerful for that program also to have mm -hmm. this available. Mm -hmm. So, good idea. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Graham. Yeah, I'd like to support that. I thought it was. It's really useful the way mm. that was all set out. Mm. Um, going back to the comment earlier on about the follow-up and there being <coughs> possibly opposition to it, in a way opposition is good because yeah. you can enter into a dialogue. What too often happens, I think, is inertia mm. um, bred by indifference. And I think that is really difficult to get around because they can just do nothing. Mm. And the do nothing thing is almost more frustrating than the opposition. Mm. Because at least when if they're opposing something, they're engaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to try and almost um, stimulate that mm -hmm. opposition so that you can actually engage or get them engaged. Mm -hmm. Whereas too often it is that sort of indifference and that inertia and, and it just disappears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, no, I had a point which was um, very similar to the point raised by Francis. Uh, in relation to maximum and minimum standards. And the question that Elizabeth Shub would ask you if she was here would be, well, who decides? You know, and, and a lot of what we had in the previous session was all about the collaborative nature of engaging any autocorrective voices. And I just thought, again, related to some of the points that came up in the panel, the notion of money, shareholders, 
Um, and in the UK, I don't know if Stuart has something he knows more about, it's the living wage. So that the kind of living wage notion, presumably they've made some calculations over what is required to live. And, yeah. whether, and I, I don't know, but have they included kind of environmental or ownership or in, in any of those kind of calculations? I don't know enough about it, but I just thought it had you know, some residents. There are people out there who are yeah, trying yeah. to put kind of minimum standards mm -hmm. on things. So. Mm -hmm. Why not also kind of bring those into the debate about sustainable consumption or mm. engage with those kinds of notions of living wages? Mm. Um, and also in terms of the kind of money and acquisition, and the, the sharing economies, the peer-to-peer -peer financing, the shared alternative economies and diverse economies, different ways of, of gaining access to, to essential services rather than the luxury ones. Mm. So I mean, I think mean, there's a lot going on around the space, of course. all very, very interesting. Um, but fundamentally, it's that, that notion of who decides and the power that resides in those decisions, ultimately. Yeah, and that's always also the risk of negotiation process. I mean, you say negotiation process, but that um, would mean that you have really everybody on the table, you know? And of course, there are always more powerful voices than others. So of course, it's all not an easy thing to do. <laughs> But, um, yeah, we have to start somehow. <laughs> and I think uh, what we most can observe that really environmental policy is in a transformation itself and is recognizing that they are a transformative actor, which I think is, a, at least in Germany, um, we, are kind of, we have been involved in several projects now that we are we should help them. We were supposed to help them in that transition to not do sectoral environmental policies, but really support this societal transformation process, which is really another understanding of environmental policy. And I think there's, you know, the primary um, progress which we can see right now that they are really moving. There's also resistance, of course, yeah, those who fear I've always dealt with waste and, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> whatever. And of course, you need those experts still, but um, you see all this very sectoral thinking and not the systemic thinking we are really um, requiring. But there's something in, in motion, I don't know whether it's similar here. And I think those people who are willing to, to get another quality there, they are supported by this kind of... Yeah, I had a, if I may, I, I had a comment in, in relation to, you know, what can policymakers do to support innovation and bottom-up initiatives, etc. And uh, what struck me as well is perhaps the removal of barriers to some of these initiatives. That could be a really important step as well. I'm thinking about the sort of alternative food movements that often then hit sort of food safety regulations for these really big barriers. Eugenie, um, exactly. Yeah, guarantee. So I think, um, you know, that that'd be another sort of in between step to maybe say remove some of these barriers or at least try and give people the space to experiment and uh, I think that's definitely something that's perhaps happening in some areas more so than in others. I think the food sector is very interesting mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Getting back to the min minimum and maximum idea, it, uh, our historian is, is my, my PhD is actually history of theory and one of the things that we don't realize I think being in the moment is that we are a complete aberration. The minimum maximum was there in living memory, the top tax rate for income tax in the US was over 90 cents in a dollar. When I was a boy, the top tax rate in New Zealand was 65 cents in a dollar. The developed world has flattened its tax, has taken off the max. Finland has a max. You know, the, the top tax rates are so high. It's a choice. No. We have just chosen not to make that choice. Of course. Mm. But it, 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 it's not that long ago. Mm. Mm. Well, could I just, just to quick punt, bounce back with you on yeah. that? There would be another theory that says that if people don't make money, they don't work. And therefore, if, 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 if you haven't got a company that That's employs nice. other people and they make profit, and other people, then, and one of the greatest things you can do for the minimum is give them a job. So there is a, there, it, I don't think it's a series as a choice. I think it's a, it's a very complicated choice between uh, how you reward wealth creators and and what that, even though it might be obscene, what bankers are using. But if you know, if, if 
the employment rate in like say China goes from you know subsistence up to a, a certain level. There's a balance there as well. I'm uh, just saying. I'm not sure if it's as simple as but if we just do 90 percent tax, well, everything would be fine. Well, we used to have a progressive, progressive system that went very high. Well, we still do have a very both in England and in Ireland are very progressive when you take in all the taxation systems. It's not as no. Maybe income tax only, it's that, it's all the other taxation that you use. That is the If you look at disposable income plus subsistence, then it's not very progressive. No. Well, I, th I think the, the debate would be where the transfer of wealth happens across society. I think if you were to minimize it down to a, a number, small number of people, I think the macro flows are quite progressive, I think, both in. in might seem not enough might be a case, but they, they are quite progressive compared to some of the places like in the United States, for example, the taxation system. Maybe just to add to the taxation debate as well, I think there are some really Im interesting impulses to maybe shift taxation away from income and towards consumption, and I think that's something we haven't discussed in much detail here, but I can see some really interesting sort of new ways of thinking about taxation that recognize that people who are better off have, have higher footprints and to consume more and to maybe get get into that sort of way of thinking in terms of our taxation system. I saw Marlene, right? Yeah, I, I feel like I always bring this up at the same time, so I'm going to do it again. But um, I think one of the issues is that we're putting profit above people. And there is uh, an economic model um, under the umbrella of the solidarity economy that has been putting people above profit. And there's nothing wrong with profit. It's just not making it the sole goal of an enterprise. So in Geneva, the solidarity economy represents 10% of jobs. Um, it's based on participative government systems. And I think the sharing economy is starting, you know, is at least in this course, picking up some of the um, rhetoric around solidarity. Then we still have to see whether it's going to be business as usual, profit making, or uh, tend towards reciprocity. But I think there are some small uh, you know, um, uh, pockets of hope that we can certainly build on. But that's a, that's not even a myth anymore. It's become a reality that profit is more important than anything else. Do you want to respond to that? Or? No, I think okay. it's just a comment. <laughs> yeah, just linking on from that. Agree well, completely. <laughs> social progress imperative or the social progress index. So we're using different, more qualitative indicators to measure people's quality of life. I'm very much in what you're saying about that whole pursuit of profit, but social competitiveness is very much a growing kind of concept, especially through the likes of the Skoll Foundation who developed the Social Progress Initiative. And like if you look at Ireland as a country, for example, there's different indicators that we can use to measure our development and across the world. And under that social progress, there are certain countries that they may have very strong economic wealth but the actual quality of life and access to, to education or opportunity of health and well-being, those indicators are far lower. So what are we actually measuring? Yeah, but this is a debate already going for, yeah. you know, 20 years, but yeah. still it hasn't, you know, yeah. had this uh, <laughs> impact. How do we define what life is in a sense? You know, how do we, what are we actually defining? So yeah. is it, it's more quantitative? Or do we want more development of qualitative indicators that actually more, more represent quality of life, and like Jonathan mentioned earlier, that what do people want mm. to live, mm. to live a good life? Yeah. Is it all this accumulation of things, or okay? I think we had lots of interesting comments. Um, questions, really interesting responses yeah, from Martina. Thank you so very much. I'd like to thank Martina again on behalf of the consensus team and also I hope on behalf of everybody. <laughs>